morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Emmanuel Lutheran Church, the second Sunday after Pentecost. Today we give thanks to God uh, that he comes to us to bless us by his Holy Spirit. And in our reading today, our gospel reading, we hear about the sin against the Holy Spirit. Uh, that'll be uh, the topic for the sermon. And we also give thanks that Christ comes to us in the sacrament. So we remember St. Paul's instruction to come to the sacrament well prepared in faith and in examination. So we remind, I remind each of you this responsibility we have before the word of God and his altar. Our opening hymn is number 528. Please rise. and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, 
I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Out of the depths, I you, o, Lord. o Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be to the voice of my for mercy. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, but with you there is forgiveness. That you may be feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits. And his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen for the morning. More than watchmen for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love. And with him is plentiful redemption. And he will redeem Israel. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty and eternal God, your Son Jesus triumphed over the prince of demons and freed us from bondage to sin. Help us to stand firm against every assault of Satan and enable us always to do your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. The Old Testament reading for the second Sunday after Pentecost is from Genesis chapter 3. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. He said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you've done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle reading is from 2 Corinthians 4. 
Since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what has been written, I believed and so I spoke. We also believe and so we speak, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. For it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So we do not lose heart, though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed day by day. For this slight momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison, as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. For we know that if the tent, which is our earthly home, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. This is the word of the Lord. the Holy Gospel, according to St. Mark, the third chapter. Glory to you, Lord. Then Jesus went home, and the crowd gathered again, so that they could not even eat. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying, he is out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, he is possessed by Beelzebul, and by the prince of demons, he casts out the demons. And he called them to him and said to them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but is coming to an end. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man then indeed he may plunder his house. Truly I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the children of men and whatever blasphemes they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they had said he has an unclean spirit. And his mother and his brothers came and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. And a crowd was sitting around him and they said to him, your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. And he answered them, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking about those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise we confess together the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church, 
I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated for the hymn. The text for our sermon this morning is from the gospel reading just read, and uh, that hymn wonderfully points us to uh, the hope that we have today, but in particular from our gospel reading, these verses. Jesus said, truly I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the children of man, and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin for they were saying, he has an unclean spirit. God's grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Today we're going to talk about this seemingly theological grenade that Jesus lobs in our gospel reading, talking about the sin against the Holy Spirit, the unforgivable sin. And we learn from other uh, passages in the Bible that it's a sin against the office of the Holy Spirit. It's a sin against the working of God to convert us and keep us in the faith. You could say the unforgivable sin is unbelief. <coughs> it's similar somewhat to the idea if you as a child or one of your children ever tried to run away from home, 
or somebody disowning their own family. It's not always just one event that caused the child to run away. It's not often one thing that causes someone to disown their family. Usually, it's a number of things. The, the saying, the straw that broke the camel's back comes to mind. You could also say this many times about divorce. Divorce is rarely ever just one sin or one event that causes the divorce. Usually it's multiple things over time. Well, how do you leave? And as we hear in our gospel reading, we hear Jesus and his family looking for him, and they were looking to, to corral him because they say he was acting crazy. So how do we leave the family of God? Jesus talks about uh, the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. So if this theological grenade is so important, then we should probably think about that. So what is this sin against the Holy Spirit? We do have more parts in the scriptures that speak directly about this. But in particular today, we find it in Mark chapter 3, our gospel reading, and then also we find it in Matthew chapter 12 and Luke chapter 12. This same saying that Jesus makes, although each, each gospel writer brings it a little different and has a few different words, they all contain the same warning, the warning against the sin, against the Holy Spirit. The author to the Hebrews mentions this sin against the Holy Spirit, and also the epistle that 1 John writes. He talks about this sin. So in actuality, we have quite a bit of information on this unforgivable sin, as mysterious as it may seem to many Christians. Pastor, what is the unforgivable sin? We hear how the sin against the Holy Spirit is, in the end, unbelief. However, very rarely is this sin against the Holy Spirit one particular sin. Like divorce and a child running away, it is rarely one particular sin, but it certainly can be. Often it is the repeated sin against the means by which the Holy Spirit works. It is not a particular sin exactly, but a sin against the office of the Holy Spirit a sin against the means by which God gives faith and sustains that faith in us. So in our reading today, the context, we see Jesus healing people, preaching his word, and the scribes, which are Jews, the scribes respond to this work of Jesus, and they call out and say, he is doing this by the devil. The scribes, they saw what Jesus had done. They heard what he said. It was plain to them who Jesus was. They knew the Old Testament. They knew the signs of the Messiah. They knew all of this in their mind and in their heart. They knew Jesus to be the Messiah, and they verbally cry out and say, he's doing the work of the devil. It is to this that Jesus responds about the sin against the Holy Spirit. And this is one clue as to what the sin of the Holy, against the Holy Spirit looks like, or rather, I should say, sounds like. It is orally spoken. Many times we Christians were afflicted because we have sinful thoughts. We may even question if Jesus is in control of our lives. We may cry out in prayer to God. We may even, at a time of weakness, believe that Jesus has lost control of things. That the devil assails our hearts and minds, and many times in our thoughts and in our hearts we doubt. We wonder. This is not a sin against the Holy Spirit. Jesus specifically says in Matthew's account, whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. Today's reading shows this. Jesus was obviously working by the Holy Spirit. He was giving faith. He was healing people. He was preaching. And yet the scribes verbally assault the Holy Spirit. 
They deny the working of the Holy Spirit. They were convinced in their hearts that Jesus was indeed the Son of God, yet they said he was of the devil. The sin against the Holy Spirit is to declare the very works of God as the working of the devil. He is possessed by Beelzebul, and by the prince of demons, he casts out the demons. It is a sin that is more than just doubting the works of God, but an outright denial of the working of the Holy Spirit, and even crediting the devil for the Holy Spirit's work. What are the works and the working of the Holy Spirit? Well, last Sunday was Trinity Sunday, and we, we confessed regular, we, and we regularly confess what the works of the Holy Spirit are. What are the things that we should know come from the office of the Holy Spirit so that we don't speak against them? In the meaning of the third article of the Creed, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints. What does this article mean? Turn in your hymnals, if you pull them out. Yeah, go ahead, unless you know it by memory. But turn to page 323. And this is why the meaning of the third article is part of our instruction in catechism. That we would know what the office and the works of the Holy Spirit are, so we would not commit this sin against the Holy Spirit. If you look on page 323 of your hymnal, the third article, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. What does this mean? I believe that I cannot, by my own reason or strength, believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to him. But the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, sanctified and kept me in the true faith. In the same way, he calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies the whole Christian church on earth and keeps it with Jesus Christ in the one true faith. In this Christian church, he daily and richly forgives all my sins and the sins of all believers. On the last day, he will raise me and all the dead and give eternal life to me and all believers in Christ. This is most certainly true. Here we have the office of the Holy Spirit clearly defined. This is why we have this as part of our catechism. So that you, dear Christian, know what the Bible says is the working of the Holy Spirit that you may not speak against these things. What the Holy Spirit does and how he works we have it clear by the guidance of the Holy Scriptures. God is not trying to trick you into committing the sin against the Holy Spirit. The devil is. Where we may find the office of the Holy Spirit is where we find the source of the living waters of faith. Where a thirsty person may go to to receive the nourishing waters of faith in the Holy Spirit, calling these workings of the Holy Spirit that you just heard, his word and sacrament, the Christian church, calling these the works of the devil and embracing that belief with your heart and knowing full well that is the work of God, that is the sin against the Holy Spirit. But pastor, I'm worried that I may have committed this sin. I've not treated the office of the Holy Spirit with respect. I've not honored the work of God through the word and sacrament. I've neglected the Holy Christian Church. I've neglected the office. I've despised the church. Pastor, have I committed this sin against the Holy Spirit? The passage in Hebrews regarding the unforgivable sin helps us here. Hebrews 6, verses 4 and 8 says, It is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit and have tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away, it is impossible to restore them again to repentance. 
impossible to restore to repentance. So if you are afraid that you have committed the unforgivable sin, that is a sign that you have not committed it. Being sorry for your sins, repentance, this is only given by the Holy Spirit. Repentance is a gift of the Holy Spirit. It's not something that we come into by some secret knowledge on our own, despising our sins and not liking them. Jesus said the Holy Spirit comes to convict the world of judgment. The Holy Spirit shows us our sins, and that Holy Spirit works through the Word of God. So one sign that you have not committed this sin is that you are worried about it, that you are concerned about it, that you desire for God's Word to teach you where faith is found. When someone rejects God's clear word on what is sin, and they continue in that sin and reject the Holy Spirit's judgment, then they are in danger of the sin against the Holy Spirit. This is why, and this month, You've seen it posted everywhere on social media and even television. This is why so-called Pride Month is so dangerous. It works to convince people that we humans can call what God calls a sin, we call it a way of life. And in fact, are even proud of it. This isn't just homosexual sin, but all sins of adultery, fornication, and pornography, even amongst those who are not attracted to the same sex. These sins are addictive, and they will work against the Holy Spirit. Living a life stuck in the sinful way of life is deadly for your sin, your faith. And approving of such things is just as wicked. Many of us have relatives and friends who live these types of prideful lifestyles. We must pray for them and do all we can to show mercy. However, we must never approve of open sin. Whether it's gay marriage or men and women living loose lives in open disregard for God's gift of marriage, the devil has done so much damage. God's gift of marriage, he has disrupted. And he has led many people to commit the sin against the Holy Spirit. This seems to be his way of working today. Pleasure over faithfulness to God's word. Certainly we've all heard Jesus' warning. If you've looked at a woman with lust, you've committed adultery in your heart. If this is you, the difference is that we don't rejoice in our sin. We don't live in open pride of our sins. We hate our sins. Do you wish to be faithful and desire to change? That is a sign that you've not committed the sin against the Holy Spirit, and God will strengthen you. By the office of the Holy Spirit, the Lord will strengthen you where you see your shortfall, where you see yourself prideful, in whatever sin that might be, turn away. To a person who's committed the sin against the Holy Spirit, they don't care. They're indifferent to the Word of God. They could care less. Whoever, though, is sorry for their sins and desires forgiveness, they should take heart. They should be reminded of their baptism and that they are just going through a tribulation in this life, that the world and the devil is afflicting them with temptation but to know that God always provides a way out. And that's the mercy and forgiveness of Christ. Again, another topic, the sin of the Holy Spirit is not a magnitude of sin. It's not a big sin versus a little sin. St. Paul points out that there is no sin too big in magnitude. He writes, where sin increased, Grace increased all the more. The sin against the Holy Spirit is a rejecting of the means 
by which the Holy Spirit gives repentance, faith, and steadfastness, the Word of God and the sacraments. Daily examination of one's life before God's Word, this is the office of the Holy Spirit. It's not a particular sin against the Holy Spirit, but it is unbelief itself. The apostles themselves, they doubted and even denied Jesus. However, they were repentant. They wanted to change. They returned to Christ for forgiveness, unlike Judas, who did not. St. Paul in 1 Timothy 1 even refers to himself. He says, formerly, I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent opponent but I received mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. Paul committed the sin of blasphemy, of speaking even against against Christ, but he was acting in blindness. He didn't know he was fighting against God. Paul spoke against Christ like Jesus' family did in our gospel reading today, like even maybe like you. the people who literally crucified Christ, what did Jesus pray for them? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they did. The sin against the Holy Spirit involves knowledge of sin which the scribes had and a willful rejection of the Holy Spirit's works. So can we see this sin? Can we point to it and look at it and say, there's the sin against the Holy Spirit? Well, it is the sin of unbelief. We cannot see it all the time. We can see evidence of it. But we as Christians do our best to heed the warnings of this sin and not work against the Holy Spirit. This is a concern of each Christian personally and not to wrongly condemn others for what we cannot know in a person's heart. But we do see their actions. However, when you are burdened with your sins, God in His mercy has given us a great treasure. That it's not because you've committed a certain, that you haven't committed a certain sin that you go to heaven, but that Jesus has died for you and is calling you to return to His family always. That the victory of Jesus over sin and death is personally given to each one of us in baptism and the Lord's Supper, confession and absolution where the Holy Spirit works to strengthen you in the faith. That when the devil afflicts you or maybe when your repentance begins to grow cold, don't run from Christ. Don't run from the working of the Holy Spirit, but run to Him. Find the office of the Holy Spirit where the Word of Christ works. Find the office of the Holy Spirit in a Christian friend, your family, but especially me, your pastor. For God has given us these treasures, the Word of God, the sacraments, to know that He will never crush even a faintly burning wick. And we might say with the man in the Gospels, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. And may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. Please rise. forward, uh, we've had a few uh, folks request 
the ability to give the prayer request cards like how we used to do in the offering plate. So what you just saw the elder, uh, Mr. Short, do is bring the plate from the back uh, where we are putting our offerings and prayer requests. Uh, if you would like for your prayer requests to be uh, read during the church service, uh, put them back there and the elder will bring the offerings and the plate forward to me and I'll see them. But if you have forgotten to put your offering or prayer request in there before church started, we'll have another offering plate there for it to, to get to where it needs to be. Um, but we are um, trying to show um, a desire for folks who want their prayer requests to be read if they're an immediate prayer request during the service today. In our prayers, we do uh, remember those who we have been praying for from our congregation and friends and family. On page 16, uh, Jerry Grantham will be uh, readmitted to the hospital. Last I spoke to um, uh, the Grantham family, uh, to Charlie. Um, she, Jerry is just having a terrible difficulty getting over her pneumonia and fluid building up. So we especially remember Jerry and Charlie today in our prayers. Let us pray for the whole church in Christ Jesus and all people according to their needs. Let us pray. Merciful God, you have sent the promised offspring, your son, Jesus Christ, to crush Satan's head forever by his death on the cross. As you gave comfort to Adam and Eve, receiving their meager confessions for the sake of your grace and promising deliverance from sin and its curse, so comfort us by the forgiveness of sins. Give us hope in the promise of eternal life in your new creation. Guide us by your Holy Spirit to drink deeply of the fount of forgiveness of sins, so that we do not starve ourselves. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our give courage, O Lord, to your church, that as we believe, so also would we speak of the resurrection of Jesus, the confident hope that we have in him, that we too will be raised and brought into his presence. Embolden us by your Holy Spirit to confess this faith from a lively conscience, that for Christ's sake, grace may extend to more and more people and increase thanksgiving to your glory. Give us courage and mercy to speak of the hope that we have in love. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, your son was rejected, even by his friends and family. Give consolation to all Christians who feel the sword of division brought about by the confession of Christ's truth especially those who cannot find agreement within their own families on the word of God from which life itself comes. Assure them that their stand for your truth is necessary. Guard them from seeking a false sense of peace and turn us in every earthly disappointment toward the promise of your eternal and undivided church triumphant. Keep us firm in the true faith until that day. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty God, no kingdom divided against itself can stand, and a house divided must fall. Graciously preserve our nation with its government. Be with our president, all our representatives, our judges and magistrates, our police, firefighters, first responders, and also the members of our military. Frustrate the work of Satan and the seeds of destruction that he would sow in every place were he not held back by your gracious hand. Unite our leaders and our people for the common good while leading us to hope in the eternal kingdom that is not of this world. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Eternal Lord, hear our prayers for your servants who suffer in this earthly tent. We especially remember those battling anxiety, depression, and addiction. We remember Jerry, Therese, Randy, Bob, Ruth, Misty and Harper, Lorraine, Paul, Paul, Jean, Art, and all of those we remember silently to ourselves. Heavenly Father, do not let them lose heart, but fix their eyes beyond what is transient to the things unseen. By this slight momentary affliction, prepare them for the eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison, where you will raise us on the last day with Jesus Christ, 
Lord, in your mercy. As Satan once overcame our first parents through the eating of the tree's fruit, we ask, O Lord, that you would overcome Satan now among us by eating of the fruit of your son's cross, his body and blood. Bless all who commune with repentance and faith that in the comfort of the gospel they may be cleansed and prepared for eternal life with you. Lord, in your mercy. What was lost in paradise has been regained by the conquering wounds of Jesus crucified and raised for us. In him, we are restored as your family, being your children. We are bold to ask you for all things. Hear us for his sake through Jesus Christ, your son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We continue on page 10. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, for the countless blessings you so freely bestow on us and all creation. Above all, we give thanks for your boundless love, shown to us when you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into our flesh and laid on him our sin, giving him into death that we might not die eternally. Because he is now risen from the dead and lives and reigns to all eternity, all who believe in him will overcome sin and death and will rise again to new life. Therefore, with angels and archangels, with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of all creation, for you've had mercy on us and given your only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. In your righteous judgment, you condemned the sin of Adam and Eve, who ate the forbidden fruit, and you justly barred them and all their children from the tree of life. Yet, in your great mercy, you promised salvation by a second Adam, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and made his cross a life-giving tree for all who trust in him. We give you thanks for the redemption you've prepared for us through Jesus Christ. Grant us your Holy Spirit that we may faithfully eat and drink of the fruits of his cross and receive the blessings of forgiveness, life, and salvation that come to us in his body and blood. Hear us as we pray in his name and as he's taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, gave it to the disciples, and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is for, given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Amen. Please rise. The true body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you in faith and life. Amen.
We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you've refreshed us through this salutary gift, and we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.